Thank you, Craig, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here again, and I mean that genuinely. It's a pleasure to be here after uh, the length of time it took uh, on the way to here. It's nice, it's nice to arrive. I have a story that I'll tell you later if you're really interested. Um, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is um, share with you uh, some of our current thinking. It, it represents work uh, in progress. I'm not going to, uh, and it's not because I don't want to, I don't have uh, profound, deep new results to, uh, to share. Um, but I do want to uh, just bring you up to date and to listen to your views uh, on current thinking with respect to uh, the role of policy uh, incentives, but also policy disincentives uh, with respect to generating more agricultural productivity growth and, and getting it done in a more sustainable way. I guess two uh, brief background context points I'd like to make at, at the outset. Um, we all understand, you all understand, that the market uh, environment in which agriculture operates is changing very rapidly. Uh, policies are not. Uh, the natural resource environment in which we're all trying to do business uh, is changing. Uh, policies are not responding uh, as quickly as they might. Uh, so one of the key messages, I think, where we uh, have reached the conclusion is that uh, there's a need for much more urgency to get on and begin to align policies uh, in many countries today more with the market uh, and the natural resource uh, realities uh, that, that exist. Um, I think it, it, it's now common wisdom that um, we all need to do more to, in our own different capacities to uh, encourage increased uh, productivity growth in the sector. Let's just review very quickly why that is. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, the growing demand for food, for feed, for fuel. You've heard about that this morning and you'll continue to hear about it. Uh, I think we all understand that with uh, additional investment, uh, we could bring uh, a little bit at least, uh, if not uh, more than a little bit, of land uh, into production, new land. We could reduce uh, unnecessary food loss and waste. And we could adopt available technologies a little more effectively and a little more widely. Uh, but one of the things that we don't talk about perhaps quite enough is how we're going to manage uh, limited water supplies going forward. Now, today, and this is a global picture, and don't worry about the numbers, but, but agriculture accounts for more than half. Our estimates are about 60% of, uh, of global use of water. Um, that's going to have to decrease, both in terms of its shear and, and in terms of the absolute uh, volume uh, over the next uh, 20 or 30 years. So in other words, agriculture is going to have to produce more, and it's going to have to do it with less water. Now that's not uh, an automatic uh, uh, equation. The, the, the answer the, uh, on, on how to do that is not immediately obvious. And it's made a little bit more complicated uh, by the reality of, of, of climate change and the uncertainty that, that that introduces as well. If we look at um, the sources of global agricultural output uh, for just a moment, um, now there's a lot more variability both within year uh, and year over year, then, of course, this graph, that, which simply shows uh, the, the decade averages. And there's also a lot of variability between, between countries. But the simple point I want to make is that we're not going to uh, increase output of, of agriculture globally uh, simply by bringing in more land, simply by applying more irrigation, simply by more intensive use of fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, we're going to have to do more to generate what's referred to here as total factor productivity, but bringing uh, all of our means of, of, of applying um, uh, land and labor and capital and technology uh, to the sector. So it requires a change uh, from, from past practices and, and from past policy orientations. Now, none of this is new to any of you. It's not new to your ministers whichever country you're from. Um, Craig mentioned the, uh, the work that is, we've had underway at the OECD, but with a, a large number of other international organizations, the FAO, the World Bank, and others, uh, to try and give good advice to ministers on what they can do to do a better job uh, of, of uh, providing a, a, a constructive and a, and a useful policy environment for the sector. 
Uh, ministers agree. Uh, there's widespread agreement on the need to improve agricultural productivity growth. There's not much uh, agreement on how to do that, and thus far there's been relatively little action viewed globally. Um, again, uh, from, from an OECD perspective, if you look just in high-income high countries, they represent a little over half of public spending on agricultural R&D and higher education. Uh, and we see no growth uh, in, the, in the past number of decades, in fact. The exception where we do see some growth in spending on R&D and, and higher education is China, and, and that's the exception. As well, again, to come back to OECD countries, uh, the proportion of spending on farm support that's dedicated to research and development, education, extension, and advisory services is very, very small. It's a single digit proportion of what's spent on farm support more generally, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. This should work. Let me turn and uh, address the, the issue uh, of, of policies uh, just for a couple of moments. Um, one of the things that's a little bit different um, in the last couple of years, at, at least um, in the way the OECD has approached the challenge of giving advice on how to improve agricultural productivity and sustainable resource use, relates to our focus on economy-wide policies. Uh, they matter. So do agricultural policies, but taken together, both the more general economic policies and in some cases social policies that countries have in place as well as agricultural policies combined to create both incentives and disincentives for improving productivity and for improving sustainable resource use through a number of, through a number of drivers in particular. The first, the pace of structural change. Secondly, the way natural resources are used. And finally, whether investments uh, in agriculture, innovation are even pursued. So again, just to underscore the importance of economy-wide policies, they matter. And here I'm referring to uh, a wide range of, from macroeconomic and governance, regulatory structural policies, uh, property rights, rule of law, all of those basic things that many of our economies uh, take for granted, but not every, uh, not every economy has, uh, has in place. But these economy-wide policies uh, determine more than anything else uh, the environment for investment. And I'm thinking particularly of, for, of private investment. Yeah. The economy-wide policies with the agricultural policies will make it more or less likely for the private sector to invest in agriculture and contribute to the kind of innovation that we're after. And again, I want to emphasize that in some countries, our analysis, very preliminary analysis, would suggest that these policies are more important than policies at the sector level in attracting private money. But of course, these policies are not always paid very much attention to by, by agricultural folks who look uh, first and foremost, maybe not exclusively, at farm policies, which I'm going to do now for a moment or two. Uh, most farm policies, as I've mentioned already, uh, in particular in the OECD area, but not exclusively, remain linked to production, remain linked to the use of inputs, or remain, remain linked to border measures, trade policies. An awful lot of agriculture policy today is essentially very large income transfers that have the impact, unintended, of impeding structural change, and quite often of the impact of encouraging more intensive use of resources, sometimes on more fragile land. Very little of the existing policy effort is directly targeted to either productivity or sustainability outcomes. Just a word on agricultural innovation systems in particular, where, again, to go beyond a lot of the traditional commodity-based approaches to agriculture and look at paying more attention to um, what we refer to as agricultural innovation systems, from all the way from the research lab, the university, extension services down to the farm. Uh, we think an awful lot more could be done to invest, to, perhaps to invest more, but in particular to invest better in improving both national and international collaboration across the whole innovation system. 
At a national level, uh, we would argue that there's a great deal more could be done to make uh, R&D more demand-driven, so it responds to actual needs of, of farmers, of, 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 uh, of uh, processing businesses. We think there's a greater role and there's a great deal of work uh, that, that's been done on this uh, inside and outside the OECD with respect to uh, public-private partnerships. But as well, international collaboration. Um, there, again, there are some examples. Uh, the Global Research Alliance that was established, I think, uh, originally by New Zealand, but has quite a number of countries that participate now, uh, trying to encourage collaboration across borders uh, with respect to research associated with, um, uh, with climate change. There's a number of other initiatives as well, but this is, this is an activity that doesn't cost money. This is an activity that requires people to talk to each other and to listen to each other uh, and, to, and to pool intellectual as well as uh, financial resources and focus on them on, on needs that are common uh, and many uh, needs with respect to pushing out the technology frontier uh, are common. As well, uh, of course, there's an important opportunity to close the productivity gap in, in many developing countries, so the gap between uh, current productivity performance and, and what is potential. Uh, this doesn't require uh, a great deal of new investment in science and technology. It's about technology transfer. Uh, it's about having in place good extension services and good advisory systems that help farmers uh, adopt technology uh, in ways that are more efficient. But for some other countries, including perhaps the one that we're in now, uh, it's about pushing out the technology frontier. It's about uh, investing more and investing better in research and development. There are, there's a great deal of research that's available not by the OECD, uh, but Julian Alston and others have done a lot of work that make very clear the returns on investment in agricultural R&D are absolutely enormous. There's relatively long time lags, but the returns are very, very impressive. Uh, yet, we've not seen significant growth uh, in uh, public R&D spending while we see a significant improvement in global markets and we see uh, the widespread ex expectation that global demand is going to remain very, very strong. Let me just wrap up uh, before we hear from people who've done some research that's more close to your home, um, and then we'll look forward to, to questions later. I want to emphasize yet again I think the, the case for improving agricultural productivity growth and more sustainable, more efficient use of land, water, biodiversities has been very, very well made. Uh, what has not happened to the same degree has been a clear identification of what are the actions that both the public and private sector uh, might need to take. Uh, I don't think there's been adequate attention to uh, the role of policy disincentives uh, nor the role of policies uh, beyond the firm gate. Again, to come back to the, uh, the enabling environment and, and, and macro structural policies and so on. Final point I wanted to conclude on, um, it, it's, it's not very difficult to give this kind of presentation at an aggregate level um, and, to, and to talk about uh, the productivity challenge in, in very, very broad terms. Uh, to, to go from that, though, to actions uh, is very difficult, but it requires us to look at the specific situation, the realities in countries and inside of countries, countries that are at very different stages of development and countries that have very different resource endowments. Uh, and this is about uh, uh, where we are right now uh, in the OECD. Uh, Craig again mentioned the, the work with the G20. Uh, we've had a great deal of support uh, from Australia, uh, intellectual support that is, uh, moral support, uh, to, uh, to work on this issue to uh, use, in fact, Australia, uh, as well as Brazil and Canada, uh, as pilot countries to um, test one way that we have developed for examining, again, policy incentives and disincentives and together to try and come up with a, uh, with a modus operandi to look at individual countries to help identify uh, for and with those individual countries uh, the kinds of actions that, uh, that, that they can take. Um, now this can be done uh, on a bilateral basis. We're quite anxious to, uh, to do that, but we're even more anxious to 
a move into the multilateral uh, forum, and in particular via the G20, uh, countries can learn uh, an awful lot from each other in the same way collaborating on R&D uh, makes a lot of sense, uh, collaborating on analytics uh, and sharing ideas about what works and what doesn't work uh, makes a great deal of sense uh, to us as well. So I look forward to any questions that you have and to continuing to work with your government. Uh, during its G20 presidency year and hopefully beyond. So again, thank you very much.